name is Kristen. I am the COO at a new company called Vectra, which is uh, the brainchild of this guy named Evan Phoenix. He, you might see him around. He's really weird, and he usually like hides away from people. Hi, I'm Jessica Suttles, I'm founding engineer at Vectra. We're working on a deployment solution. If you'd like to hear more about it, you can find us later. So um, we, went, we weren't planning on doing a lightning talk, but we realized that um, there's kind of a big issue out there. A lot of people don't know how to use a kazoo. <laughs> Makes me kind of sad, because it's, I think, a big part of my childhood, and maybe you never learned, or your childhood is just gone, but we're here to bring it back to you. Um, yeah, a lot of people don't know how to use a kazoo like this guy right here. But he's trying to use his arm. It's not even kazoo. Yeah, it's not. That doesn't work at all. But um, luckily, you have the parts to use a kazoo. Dogs don't. They'll never get to use one ever. So I know a lot of you have kazoos. Take them out. Hold them up. Represent. Thank you. Um, let's start. First, the wide end goes in the mouth. Second, you don't just blow. You hum or say who. Let's do it together. <laughs> Yay! Um, and then you celebrate. Yay! Yeah. <laughs> Woo! We remember childhood. <laughs> OK, so I think you're all ready for a little call and response. So I'm going to call, and then you respond, in case you've never done that before. You ready? All right, that was good. So I think you guys are ready for the advanced one. Um, some of you might know Mario. That is from the childhood. And let's see if we can do this a uh, little more. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call, and then you respond. Okay. Okay. It's a little more complicated, <laughs> even for professionals like me. Maybe we should try that again. <laughs> Okay, one more time. Let's all do it together. One, two, three. Yay! Okay. So I think that our talk was very successful, um, but for posterity's sake, I want to do something that would be kind of cool, especially on the video. Um, a din of kazoo. So we're going to start really low and quiet, and then as we raise the arms, we're going to get louder and higher. You guys ready? All right. OK, thank you. If you, uh, if you want an alpha test Vectra, come see us. We're in the hallway creeping today and tomorrow. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Claudio, and you've heard my last name, so I'm not going to repeat it. <laughs> I, did, I did well? Was that, did that perfect. Yes! I'm going to talk about a jam that's open source. It's called BH, Bootstrap Helpers for Ruby. So if you've ever used uh, Bootstrap, you know it's very convenient because you write less CSS, because it's in Bootstrap already. But you have to write some HTML to make your HTML look like what Bootstrap asks. With this gem, you write less HTML as well. That's what it does. And there's the link to the GitHub page. So this is the example. This is I work for a company called Fullscreen. This is one of our apps. This is the sign up page without any CSS. It looks kind of bad. If you add Bootstrap CSS, it's centered. The button is blue. The form is very nice. But this is the HTML you come up with. You have to add all these classes, your divs, your roles, and all of that. And even if you use, in, for instance, in Rails form for the helpers, you still have to add all these uh, classes, attributes, and so on. If you use BH, this is what you end up with. It's basically clean it. Oh, I heard some. Oh. <laughs> it cleans up your, uh, your views. Basically, you add this one attribute to your uh, form four that's layout horizontal because that's one of the um, layouts that Bootstrap gives you for forms, horizontal form. And then you 
you know, all those divs, all those extra uh, attributes that kind of pollute your views, they, they're gone. And um, it, it still looks like this. And one of the advantages is that if suddenly your designer says, you know what, I don't want the form to be horizontal anymore, meaning there is that label on a line and then the submit button below. I want an inline form now. If you have to go and change all that HTML, it takes a while. Instead, you can just do layout inline, and that's it. And you can add, for instance, context success, and then the button is going to be green instead of blue. Just one more example, alert box. So if you want a, a button that says, what is Gorilla? I guess you're all curious about that. And then when you click, it shows a model on top of your window. This is all you need. There's a helper called model. And you specify the body and the title, and that's really all there is to it. And if you didn't have BH, this would be what, if you go to the documentation of Bootstrap, it tells you that you have to write. You have to type a button and a div, and so on. So I uh, try to include as many Bootstrap components. That's how they're called. So you have panels, you have nav bars, models, drop downs, and they're all pretty easy to use. For instance, if it's a drop down, the helper is just called drop down. Same with icon and so on. And um, it doesn't change your CSS. You can just drop it in your app. It works with Padrino, it works with Middleman, it works with Rails 3 and Rails 4. It doesn't overwrite anything by default, so you can just put it in and then start using this together with your own normal code. And it has a GitHub page, code, code coverage, tested, everything you need. And that's all, and still, because I have one minute left, I'm just going to say thank you to the organizer and everybody has talked about how Ruby makes people happy. So if you want to make me happy, go there and start my project. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Richard Schneeman or uh, Schneems. So he actually said Schneeman, which is how you mispronounce Schneeman. It's, uh, it's very strange. Amazing. Yeah, it's okay. Uh, does anybody know what this is? Okay. This uh, reticulated Python? Wow, that's very specific. <laughs> that was a Python. Does anybody know the biggest difference between Ruby and Python? <laughs> one, one is a snake. Okay, why would like in general? Why would you choose one? Um, a, a, a little background. Um, I am a Ruby developer. Uh, my wife, uh, her name is Ruby, but she is a Python developer. <clears throat> And, and I talk to, uh, I, I work for a company called Heroku. There's a lot of people who run Python apps um, and who love Python, and I ask them all the time, like, why do you love Python? Why choose it over Ruby? And, you know, like, is it white space? Is it speed? Is it, is it libraries? Um, I, I just want to talk about flow control and milk for a second. Uh, so my experimentation with Python, there, there's a function that looks for an element in an array, and if it's not there, what does it do? It throws an exception. In Ruby, if it's not there, it's just like, oh, hey, we don't have this thing in the array. And it's basically like, hey, Ruby, go to the store and get me some milk. And Ruby's like, uh, the store didn't have any milk. In Python, you're like, hey, go to the store and get me some milk. And it's like, oh, they didn't have any milk. Ah, so I burnt the thing down. <laughs> So, so that, that, that is not the answer to why people love Python. Um, uh, uh, Python programmers love docs. Every single uh, Python programmer I've ever talked to is like, oh my gosh, the docs are amazing. Like, have you seen the docs? They have all these doc tools and all these doc sites. Um, and generally, in just in, uh, Ruby programmers, we don't consider a, a project published until it is fully, you know, fully tested or at least reasonably tested or, you know, at least run. T tested. It, tested. It ran one time, that it, one time. Yeah, no, to I, pr I swear this, I, it worked at one point in time. It uh, works on my machine. Yeah, and in, in Python, uh, it's cultural that you don't, uh, a project is not published until it has, is fully documented. Um, so I was wondering, I was like, well, okay, that's what, like, why can't we have better documentation in Ruby? Like, what, what is out there uh, that is preventing us from doing that? Um, and, and in general, writing docs is too hard, ex especially right now. We already have a ton of undocumented code out there that is just like, whoa, what is, what is going on? Um, also, you know, reading docs is hard. Like, where do you, where do you start to do that? Uh, so I would like to introduce something. <clears throat> B 
bum, that was amazing. Bum, thank, bum, bum, thank, bum, 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 thank you all. Um, uh, called DocsDoctor.org. It is uh, intentionally the most difficult to pronounce name I could come up with. <laughs> <clears throat> and uh, if you go to DocsDoctor.org, you can sign up to, say, get uh, documented methods in your email inbox every day from, say, like Rails slash Rails or Ruby slash Ruby um, or basically anything. It, it, uses, uh, it uses Yard, thank you very much, Lauren, uh, to, to parse documentation. And it can, it can send you a documented method so you can learn more about a library. And you can be like, oh, cool, I didn't even know Rails had this method. Um, or you can also uh, use it to write documentation. It, if, you, if you ask, it will send you undocumented methods. Uh, so there's a gentleman in the, in the front row. Um, you might know him. He has a lot of commits on a project. I challenge you to beat him in this number of commits in nothing but documentation commits <laughs> using this tool. And the world will actually be a better place for it. Like we need, uh, there's a lot of places where the documentation does kind of fall short. So, um, uh, and, and this is kind of a, a sister project to another one that I've been working on called Code Triage. You might be familiar with it. But if you, if you, um, if you walk away from this lightning talk with only three things to remember, it's docsdoctor.org, docsdoctor.org, docsdoctor.org. And, and one last thing, docsdoctor.org. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, I'm Shannon Skipper, or Havenwood on the GitHubs, and I'm talking about transducers. So um, Rich Hickey, I'm sure some of you have seen his talk, did a talk, and what I learned from it was their burritos. Um, but this burrito isn't a transducer, because the cheese isn't on top. So um, let's look at a typical Ruby burrito. Um, I put an underscore in front of map and select, um, just because they're, to show that they're not the real map and select. But um, you see they have a block, they have the source collection, um, et cetera, but on the inside of this burrito is shoveling onto an array. So there's a lot of reducing methods on enumerable, but they all shovel onto an array. So what Rich Chicky pointed out was this piece in the middle, you can't get at from the outside. Um, you're appending onto the array, and that's what you have to do with map, with select, and with a lot of the other reducing methods. So what might it look like to put that on the outside? Um, these are mapping and selecting. So on these methods, the initial object and the reducing step is available on the outside. So what would that look like using it? Like that. So you could, the first one, array.mapping, is a lot like, I mean, it's exactly like array, map, and next but you start seeing a difference when you put a set in there. So instead of building an array, it builds a set. Or if you switch out the reducing function to on queue, you could build a queue. Um, and then just for fun, you could have the initial object be standard out and print to it. But you could do this with other methods on enumerable. Um, this is an example of rejecting and taking while. Um, but is that really a transducer? <laughs> So transducers are powerful, composable ways to build algorithmic transformations that you can use in many contexts. So we're not quite there yet. Um, but here's an example. In Ruby, we don't have a composed method like uh, Clojure does. But we can build one pretty easily just by opening up the proc class. And so you can have something like add one, square it, and then add 42. And with this transducer style, you could build any type of object from an array to a set to whatever you want to build but it's still not a transducer <laughs> um, because you can only be mapping or selecting or taking while. And the idea is to compose a little bit of each of those together and be able to apply it to a number of different scenarios. So um, can you do it for real? You can, there's a transducers gem that Cogitech released um, for Ruby as well as JavaScript, Java, Clojure, and they're uh, gonna release it for more languages. But it doesn't really look like Ruby. Um, instead of the source collection being first, it's last. They just completely reverse the order. So what might it look like if it was more Ruby-ish? Down at the bottom, um, you can see what it might look like to transduce in a more Ruby style. Um, and here's an example of what we can already do. So the burrito analogy is basically the idea that we have all these ingredients 
but we have them in a different order. We don't have the cheese on top. So maybe it's nice to have the cheese on top. And that's it. Well, thank you very much. Hello, my name is Sean Culver, and today I'm going to tell you about the five finger secret to success. And uh, I work at Zeal. Uh, I love to come to work every day uh, because of great my, uh, all of my great coworkers and all the fun projects we, we do there. Uh, but this one secret is quite powerful. So everyone calm down. It won't be pr as profound as Sandy Metz talk uh, today and inspiring, or will it? <laughs> there are several secrets involved with this, and the first is enthusiasm. The second will make you feel happy. And it's also a great way to start your day. <laughs> and it's something you do when you have a success. So. But before I tell you the secret, which is the lifeblood of our company, and decades of research went into this, I'll let you know that it's, it's kind of small and it's so small, it might blow your mind. High, stellar high fives. So simple and yet so powerful. They bring a sense of accomplishment, belonging and connectedness. And that's our secret. It's very simple. What are the rules? Putting on your shirt is one rule. <laughs> uh, when you figure out a, a really complex problem, it's great to give somebody a high five. When they make a great refactor, give them a high five. Any small achievement, please give them a high five. When your pair comes up with an awesome idea, give them a high five. You can high five a stranger. <laughs> it's OK. Jumping high fives are awesome. That's not actually a rule. But this is a lightning talk, so. Give everyone a high five in your group and never leave anyone out. That's really important. And you can high five just about anything. <laughs> and even cats enjoy high fives. I would not suggest high fiving a killer whale. <laughs> Superheroes love high fives, unless you're the Hulk. <laughs> high fives can go terribly bad. <laughs> they can go terribly wrong. Now I'm going to teach you how to give stellar high fives. The first step is look, look someone in the eye. The second step. <laughs> is cock your arm back, and your elbow should be about here. Let your body announce that you're going to give a high five. Then fire your hand looking towards the elbow. That's the secret, actually, is looking towards the elbow. And that's it. It's as simple as that. So now that we've learned it, it's your turn for glory. Everyone stand up, please. I know I'm making everyone stand up, but. On the count of three, everyone's going to use what they learned and give an awesome high five, a stellar high five. Hold on, hold on, hold on. <laughs> three. Woo. <laughs> All right. Yes. Oh, all of it. Up top, down low. Oh, yeah. Nice. <clears throat> all of you rock. Thank you so much. And please let this not be me. <laughs> Do great things. Bring enthusiasm passion and joy to your work and your life, and give stellar high fives. 
we have the first 100 people to register, get free t-shirts. We created a website, stellarhighfive.com. Go there quickly before they're all gone. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. I'm Stephen Talcott Smith. Like all of you, I love to code. Like many of you, I spend a lot of time thinking about how to make my own and uh, my team's efforts more efficient and how to deliver value faster. In this respect, I sometimes see code as the enemy. When I code myself, I try to write code that eliminates other code. I want my teams to produce more value and reduce or eliminate the low value activity. One thing that many people have noticed is that the imperative style of procedural logic tends to multiply code. So how do we reduce or eliminate that? At the right level of abstraction, a DSL can cut out a lot of low value handcrafted logic. I look for places where we're feeling a lot of pain and where a lot of low value code is being produced. And um, in Rails apps, I think the most uh, neglected place seems to be the view. In uh, hundreds of applications that I've come across, the chaos reigns most completely in the view. So I've been circling this problem for years in different ways. And finally, I began to work uh, this year on a gem called Express Templates. Um, here's an example of an Express Template. Uh, it's a subset of Ruby. It uses Ruby's block structure and execution order to indicate the nested structure of a document and the configuration of components. Uh, conditional logic and statements are strongly discouraged here. Uh, Ruby statements that you see reference components or tags. Uh, this, this particular template generates a page that looks like... Uh, Maybe I can't show it to you. <laughs> All right. In any case, um, the components are built also in a declarative style, and uh, this demonstrates reusable logic patterns uh, as well as embedded template code, which is there in the form of a stabby lambda or proc. It's just Ruby. Um, this works. You know, contrasts with Haml, ERB, and Slim, they all compile uh, a special grammar which contains embedded Ruby code into a bunch of um, code that works with strings to produce markup. This code is then evaluated in the context of the view. Express Templates adds a step I call expansion, sort of analogous to a macro system. The expansion results in a tree of nodes which all respond to compile. Components, tags, and um, wrappers for helpers are all in the tree. <clears throat> At the end of that process, uh, once you call compile, you end up with, again, uh, Ruby code that works with strings that's evaluated in the view. Uh, the real power of this approach is that it facilitates the development of component libraries, something commercial application platforms have long enjoyed and something that I miss when I personally develop GUIs. Um, I'm working on different components right now, including Table 4, Tree 4. Uh, I'm uh, working on some advanced form components. And I think that this concept maps very well to something that uh, I've seen out there in HTML5, which is the web components. Um, we can also include JavaScript frameworks and behaviors along with the components. So you, again, have the server driving the layout of the code. Um, all of these things can be extended in object-oriented fashion. Uh, check it out. It's up on GitHub. Uh, I'm hosting the BOF session tonight about the Rails view, although I'm also interested in engines. Uh, <laughs> um, we're using this in our admin framework. Uh, it's, on, it's on GitHub, Alogica, Express Templates. Uh, I'm expecting to release a production-ready version Q, uh, in uh, Q1. I'm Stephen Talcott Smith. My company is Alogica. We have great software teams for hire. Uh, I'm based in Lake Tahoe and Manila. Um, I also recently published a book, Level Up, Tips and Techniques to Become a Better Professional Software Developer. Uh, there's a, co a coupon code there for RubyConf 2014. And lastly, uh, we, uh, this last year, we sponsored uh, the first Ruby conference in the Philippines. And next year, 2015, it is going to be held in Boracay Island, which is a fantastic beach resort. Um,
go ahead and submit a talk proposal if you want to go there <laughs> and uh, check it out at rubyconf.ph. Thank you very much. So this is the five minute version of a talk I'm working on, investigative debugging, conducting a criminal investigation in your code. Uh, my name is Brandon Rice. I'm a software developer at Optoro in DC. Um, and I've, as of the beginning of November, I am entering my uh, second anniversary, my second year as a professional developer. Before I was a developer, I was a cop. And um, being a cop is a lot about imagery. It's about a facade. It's about convincing everyone in the general public that you and your, uh, all of your cop friends are a lot more like Colin Farrell when you might really feel more like Jonah Hill. So. <clears throat> That being said, when I was a cop, I had a very specific job. I was an investigator. I investigated arson crimes. Um, and investigating arson crimes is a lot like showing up at this, and your job is now to figure out, in all of this mess, where the remains of the candle were that uh, ignited the curtains. Or maybe you need to figure out where the remains of the gasoline trailer were with the matches that actually ignited the curtains. And you better be right, because the difference means someone going to jail for 20 or 30 years. So the methods that you use have to be proven, they have to be repeatable, they have to stand up in court um, when you're an expert witness testifying to a bunch of people and a judge. So the methods that you use, the methods, in this case, the me one of the methods that we use, obviously, the scientific, scientific method. And I think that a lot of these principles can be applied to the, the things we do as developers, especially when debugging. Um, and Quickly, I'm going to take kind of a whirlwind tour to how I approach a lot of these debugging problems drawing from my past experience. So stating the problem, this is the easy part. Jira, Pivotal, tickets, user stories, someone's probably already done this for you. Um, doing the research, all of these are techniques that I use on a weekly, if not daily basis to gather all of the research before I make any assumptions. Um, I think the big one in all caps at the bottom, talking to the stakeholders is probably something we don't do a lot as developers. Talk to your business associates, your clients, other people that aren't developers. Um, and probably the one that I do last, which is probably not good, is talking to my coworkers and peers. I like to exhaust all my resources before I realize that I'm stupid and go talk to my coworkers. So I probably shouldn't do that. Um, so hypothesizing is, a, is pretty much the same whether you are an investigator or a developer, and it's really just a nice way of saying you're standing around bullshitting with your friends, um, <clears throat> which is true. Uh, experimenting, red, green, refactor. We all know how to do this. It's also kind of the easy part and the part you actually probably spend the least amount of time doing. Um, analysis. This is actually probably what I consider to be the most important part. Um, establishing a timeline. The, so the things on the right are the approach I took as an investigator. Um, but in developer terms, it basically means um, coming up with a good, solid e explanation of what you did, why you did it, and how you did it. And that means maybe writing an email, maybe putting it in your ticket comments. But whatever it is, you need to be able to um, clearly state what you did, why you did it, how you did it, and that's important because if you introduced a bug while you were fixing a bug, then someone's probably gonna have a bad time and wanna know what you did and how to repeat what you did. Um, oh, uh, so yeah, at the end of the day, um, maybe you've, the reason you've uncovered, which is the, the illness and not the symptom of your problem, um, is not really fixable in the day and a half that you have or whatever to handle a ticket. So I call that considering a plea, which is maybe you fix something smaller and then make a new ticket. Um, so at the end of the day, I embrace this methodology when I'm working on bugs. Um, I strive to fix illnesses, not symptoms. I think that developers should be held to a higher standard of proof um, because the development community gets some flack for not having certification. Um, allowing things to ship out that are filled with bugs. So why don't we, uh, there's no perfect way to certify a developer really, so why not take it on ourselves to embrace that higher standard of, higher standard of proof? And that's all I have, um, thanks. And the question I usually get most is why and how I left law enforcement to become a developer, and it's a long story, but the short answer is happiness. And um, if you wanna know the longer version, you can come talk to me, I love being happy in a career that I'm happy in, and I will gladly explain uh, how I got there. So, thanks.
Thank you. So hi, I'm Alex. I work for Amazon Web Services. I actually am relatively new to Ruby. I was in the Java world for quite a long time. And this is a little bit of a beginner lightning talk. I just want to discuss one thing that I found tricky when I first came into the Ruby world and how I got through it. And hopefully it'll be useful to someone. So we're talking about duct typing. Everyone who talks about duct typing has to make this joke. So anyways, coming from the world of Java, there is a whole lot of boilerplate and ceremony code. Yes, this is a real class name. So, <laughs> not having to write this in the world of Ruby has brought me a lot more happiness. So I wanted to go through a quick example of what this looks like. So this, can we see this clearly? Good. So this is a very simple class for illustration. It takes a hash, it writes it to a file as JSON, and it can read it back. What you'll notice is the handler for file writing is passed in. So all we expect is that it takes a write signature of a certain type and a read signature of a certain type, and as long as that acts like file I.O., it will work. So we have a test class here, which shows you one way of doing it, where we pass in a stub handler because you probably don't want to have side effects like file writing or network access breaking your tests. So this will simply say, write it and read it from an in-memory hash, treating that like your file system. So that works. And one thing you'll realize is, uh, raise your hand if you've programmed in Java before, if you came to Ruby from Java. Leave your hand up if you're looking forward to the interface setup you would have to do to get this to work without code duplication. One hand, guy's hand is up, but I think he was actually patting his head. So <laughs> nobody. Here's the neat thing. You can just as easily have an Amazon S3 backed file system, and as long as you write a short adapter to handle write and read the same way, it just works. So here's the live coding part. So we have a path to a file and a hash. So if I create a new IO writer using the file class, oops, joys of live demos, never do it. So you can write the file. Read it back, it works. Of course it works because it's built for file I.O. Does it work when we back it with Amazon S3? We'll just pass in a bucket name because you need that for it to work. In fact, let's just do exactly the same calls. Let's do, <laughs> I did that the last couple times too. Using the exact same calls, It works the same. The power of duct typing is simply that it reduces the amount of boilerplate code you have to write. As long as you follow the same contracts, you can swap things in. And if you're writing a library, you don't have to put excessive enforcement on your users of how they write things. You give a reasonable contract and trust them to do things the right way. So that's my spiel on duct typing. I hope it helps someone. Hi, I'm P. Philip Ar Arente, was it? Uh, Arente. Arente, okay. I'm Philip Arndt. I'm uh, from New Zealand, as you can probably tell from the swallowing of the vowels when I talk. It is extremely bright on stage. I don't know how the speakers do it. Um, I'm here to, I guess as a representative of Rails Camp New Zealand, um, to talk to you about that. So imagine yourself and a group of Ruby programmers, like Hero is here, on a country retreat for a weekend of talks, hacking, and fun, but in summertime. So that's what Rails Camp New Zealand is. This will be the fifth edition in 30th of January to the 2nd of February 2015. What this is, is we give uh, transport from and to Auckland Airport 
um, Auckland, New Zealand. Um, you get on a bus, you arrive at camp, you sleep, eat extremely good food, drink extremely good drinks, non-alcoholic and alcoholic, hang out uh, while ignoring the outside world. We return you on Monday morning, you can stick around in New Zealand, or you could go to RubyConf Australia, which is the very same week. Uh, this is the fifth New Zealand camp, and Australia has had 16. So where is New Zealand, you might say? Well, that's fair enough. So <laughs> this is a map from Esri, you know, the mapping company. They forgot to include New Zealand. <laughs> this is off a, a Tumblr called World Maps Without NZ. It's a, a, extremely popular to forget New Zealand. So I've, I've gone to the trouble of preparing a route map for New Zealand. There we go. So you can go directly from here to Shakespeare Regional Park, which is where we'll be. It's about 16 hours, according to Google, and it is usually an overnight flight, so you get nice and good sleep. So here's a list of things which may or may not happen. It's fairly self-explanatory. So all meals are included, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Anybody has the opportunity to speak, you don't have to do a CFP or anything like that, you can actually just write your name on a whiteboard, much like the lightning talks, haha. -ha. And I'm going to show you some photos from the last camp that we had at Mount Cheeseman in New Zealand's Southern Alps, and we have a full code of conduct that everyone has to adhere to. So we're very welcoming to people of all ages. We have amazing and strange wildlife, and unlike Australia, none of it is out to get you. <laughs> We usually have pretty extremely good coffee, it's, which is something that New Zealand, I think, is getting more and more known for. And now I'm just going to run through photos. We were on top of a mountain, so we won't be the next time, but there will be water around us. Yes, that is a onesie. <laughs> And I think it was taken around 5 a.m. And that is really the sky above New Zealand. Here's some photo credits. And a picture of the group from last time. So that information again, which I guess I could just hold up for one minute and 24 seconds, but I won't waste your time. <laughs> You have to sing if you're going to do that while it's up there. I have to sing? There. Yeah. Okay. Did you bring your kazoo up? I, didn't, I don't even have a kazoo. Well, that's not my fault. <laughs> you say it's not your fault, but... It is, sort Yvonne, of my, it is actually sort Yvonne of... Yvonne Phonix. It is actually sort of my fault. <laughs> okay. Cool. So uh, come and talk to me afterwards if you want to come. It's 315 New Zealand dollars, which is like, I don't know, 40 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you very much for your time. Hey, everyone. My name is, uh, well, until now, I thought it was Jeremy Cows, but as we all know, Evan Phoenix is infallible, so I learned something I new today. <laughs> I hope not when it comes to names. <laughs> uh, I work at Coding Zeal, the magical wonderland in the forests of northern Oregon, where in between constant high-fiving, we occasionally write code. Um, you can find me on Twitter at KXCRL. No, the letters don't mean anything. So this is a little bit uh, less lighthearted than Sean's talk. Um, my background's in science, so I wanted to start with some beliefs and assumptions before I dive into it. It's my belief that just because an assumption isn't completely mapped to reality, isn't 100% factual, of course if it was it wouldn't be an assumption, that it's a bad assumption to have or one to keep carrying with you. And so for your consideration, um, I'd like you to contrast. People are inherently good and we just need to do everything we can to give them opportunity. Versus, people are inherently evil. We need to do everything we can to give them incentive. And by incentive, I pretty much mean punishment. So my answer to this, which is kind of a classical philosophical question, is, has always been society. I mean, the fact that it came out of nothing, became what it is, and continues to progress in the directions that it does, in ways that people continue to be more and more honored and able to express themselves and enjoy their jobs, uh, says to me that there must be something essentially good in humans. And if there's not, it's at least good for us to assume so. So on that note, I'm going to say the Ruby community is inherently good, and inherently good at kazoos. And uh, we should do everything we can to give them opportunity. 
So one of the questions I have is, how do you see all the sides of a 3D object? Like this screen, for instance. And you actually can't from where you're sitting because you have two-dimensional vision with just a little bit of depth perception. You would have to walk around the other side of it, right, and get another perspective. And so one of the things that we have to do often is get multiple perspectives on things that are highly complex, right? Like the things that we work on every day that have a lot of moving parts that we definitely can't see at the same time. Well, what about something that's, say, multidimensional, abstract, highly volatile, constantly transforming, silent, and to many people, completely invisible? Something like equality. So. I believe fundamentally that more perspectives means more information, means more understanding, and ultimately more capacity to make good decisions, the correct decisions, and decisions that will benefit you. And this is a whole lot of philosophical front-loading to say that I often come to conferences and I meet all of these amazing people, all of you, and I hear all of these brilliant insights and all of this unique perspective on problems and I say, where can I find your blog? Where is your YouTube channel? Where have you been on last week tonight? And they haven't. I mean, not that anybody is really gonna appear on last week tonight, but, and I realized I can't really complain about this because I actually don't do that either. So I wanted to take a stand and sign up for a lightning talk and commit in front of everyone at RubyConf, I'm gonna start a blog. And it's probably not gonna make me famous, but at least it will avoid a few moments of you know, having a problem that you can never find an answer to. I ultimately think that every one of us should be sharing that more information is better. And that all comes back to that all of this, Ruby, the language that we program in, Rails, the framework that we use, the building that we sit in, and all of the society that we're a part of, we invented it. And we taught it to each other. And by your very nature as a human being, you iterated on it. And I think we should all be sharing what we're finding. Thank you. Let's talk about robots underwater. <laughs> Specifically, remotely operated vehicles, or ROVs. An ROV is a huge robot that you would use if you owned an oil company and you had to examine or repair your offshore oil rig. For a, a, an idea of the size, take a look in the lower left corner of that photograph. You see a human performing maintenance on an ROV. And here's another huge, multi-million dollar ROV. Now, there's no reason that an ROV should cost millions of dollars and be so huge. A few guys in Berkeley, California, two guys in Berkeley got together and they created Open ROV. Open because it's all open source, ROV because it's an ROV. Cost less than $1,000. You can buy one for about 850 bucks. And here's an Open ROV in action with a scuba diver. And here it is again. A few features of the Open ROV. It has lasers, bright LEDs, and lithium ion batteries for power. Now, the lasers are not there so you can zap fish. That's not why you have oh, lasers. I thought this was James Bond. The lasers are there. They're about 10 centimeters apart. They're parallel, and you shine them on objects so you can gauge the size of objects. So they're very useful. Everything about Open ROV is open source. TCPIP, Node.js, Socket.io. Socket.io is there for real-time bi-directional communications. Node.js is what the web app running on the Open ROV is written in. And TCPIP, of course, is the language that is used when you communicate between your Open ROV and your laptop. Node runs on the BeagleBone Black. That's the one that's being held in the photograph. There's an Arduino chipset on the controller board at the bottom. There are three event loops, one running in the browser on your computer. Typically, you'll use Chrome. On your uh, BeagleBone Black, there's another event loop running in Node.js. And on the Arduino, you have a third event loop running in C++. And if you want to take a look at the code, you can go to GitHub right now. Go to github.com slash openrov, take a look at it. Now you get real excited, you ordered this thing, it comes to you in parts, and you have to put them together. And this is, you know, me putting mine together a little bit at a time, and there it is again with all the junk in my work workshop until finally it was complete and I could test it out in Chicago's Lake Michigan. There you see my thumbs up, there's a web browser, that's Chrome running on Ubuntu, and those are rocks at the bottom of Lake Michigan. It worked really well. So, 
You've got it running. It works in your bathtub, works in Lake Michigan. So your next step is to, to take it out to the Caribbean. And that's where we're hosting a Ruby conference in the Caribbean. We call it Ruby Carib in January. It'll be cold in Chicago, but warm in Barbados where we're holding this. Ruby Carib is a Ruby conference in the Caribbean, five days in the Caribbean, 30-minute talks. Each 30-minute talk will be followed by a two-hour lab directly tied to the talk that you just went through. And the speakers are Laurent Cincinnati, the inventor of Ruby Motion, Dave Estelles, who wrote Ruby List that runs on iOS, uh, Randall Thomas, who's going to go through, um, um, go through machine learning on Ruby. Hands-on labs, open ROV, and you get to do this. At night, we'll hack on open ROV. By day, we'll hack on Ruby. At night, we'll hack on open ROV. And on Friday afternoon, we're going to take the open ROV out on the Caribbean and test it out on a boat and look at some fish. And we won't zap the fish with the lasers. So... Take a look at rubycarib.com and check out uh, everything that you could possibly want to know about OpenROV. Thank you for listening. Thank you. All right. Hi, uh, everyone. I'm Tim, uh, I guess. I don't know. That's good enough. Tim's anymore. fine, I think. So um, I work on the uh, core services team at Living Social. And yes, we're hiring. And you know, it's an awesome place to work. And there's 20 odd people of us here. So if you're interested, come and uh, talk to one of us. So, um, yeah, I'm going to talk about uh, what we have uh, basically uh, discovered about maintaining a large number of uh, interdependent apps and services when uh, we need to develop these services and uh, the client applications and the uh, access gems for, for, this, uh, for, for all of this. So how do you actually test them all in, in isolation, right? So one of the things that you know, we also use, and a lot of people use, is you know, VCR for this to, to short circuit um, any, uh, any of the calls to, to dependencies. But you know, who really would like to be committing and maintaining all those cassettes in their repos, right? So uh, also, VCR cassettes are good only if you refresh them. And really finding a good frequency to refresh them is, is kind of hard, right? So the other option is using Oh, sorry. The other option is using mocks, uh, something that you know, a lot of people do. But you know, um, using tools like Mocha and, and uh, RSpec mocks is uh, is good, but uh, it results in a lot of setup code usually. Right? You uh, use that code both. Um, you have to you know, have to write it. It's cumbersome. It's kind of boring, and it also you know if your API in the backend changes or behavior changes, your tests won't even notice. Right? So yeah, that's downsides. Uh, so faced with that, what we have be begun doing is um, just our team at Living Social started an approach where we still use test, do uh, test doubles, uh, wider term for you know, mocks and stubs and everything, and, uh, but not to, to compromi compromise our test suite um, runtime. So we still want to have fast runtimes. That's why we use do uh, test doubles. But um, we're also the maintainers of our own client gems, which actually puts us in a position to add realistic sample objects uh, to those gems that expose the service API. And so th the trick here is that we evolve our mocks, um, you know, meant to be used by the client applications, uh, in lockstep with our service. So um, yeah, how do we, you know, how do we do this? We basically have an have an approach where we uh, we implement two backends in our client gem. So one that actually makes HTTP calls uh, to reach out to the backend services and you know, ex exposes that, that exposes the API. And another one that's actually a mock backend, which uh, really makes no such calls. It doesn't call out to, to any service. It short circuits the calls and instead serves that data out of an in-memory hash. And the key here is that both the fake and the real uh, backend expose the exact same interface. So the layer of the gem that exposes the actual API that a client can consume uh, has a way to inject one of the two backends. And um, yeah, the, so the, the, this API exposing layer really just makes calls only to, uh, to backend methods that are exposed in that contract. So the other, the other part of it is that we actually have um, the mock backend serve objects with the exact same API that the, the objects 
uh, would have that are exposed by the real service. Um, so the, their action, the, not just that, they're actual instances of the exact same model classes uh, that, re that are returned by the, the real backend. And um, we, also, we also make sure that the mock backend is used um, in, in test mode, that when it's used in test mode, that it comes with uh, realistic, preloaded fakes. So by that I mean in our example, for example, it's a, it's a service that uh, serves market or city information, then the ex you know, client access gem, which is called LS Cities, is switched into a, a mock backend mode and just serves those objects uh, with a, a, a range of really well-known markets and city objects out of it. So how does this, um, how does this all look? Really, uh, we, we try to optimize to make it easy, uh, possible for the client apps to use the mocks um, as easy as feasibly possible. So the application under test just places one single line uh, to put this thing into a mock mode into its test helper or you know, wherever you want to use this. And this line configures to serve the responses uh, entirely out of that in-memory you know, back-end registry of preloaded you know, objects that uh, like preloaded cities. That's a lot, right? So in the, the next case is it, in case you're, you actually have a need for, uh, for special test cases, special test objects, special canned responses, mm -hmm. The app um, can test that with customized mocks that you can just, you know, you instantiate the, the test mocks that use the exact same objects and you just inject them into that, that test backend. So, um, so what's the whole point of this? Well, we, we, we still have fast tests. We still use mocks. We reduce the, the repo pollution with uh, uh, VCR cassettes. Um, we, uh, we increase the level uh, of confidence in our test suites. And um, that is by using the exact same objects that are, you know, used on and developed in, in lockstep with the, with the client library. Um, we have less boring boilerplate code to write and maintain to set up mocks and expectations. And the client apps work with realistic fakes that behave exactly like the real thing. So, um, yeah, what, uh, the, the last thing that's really pretty much all I wanted to say, uh, we have a really good tech blog. Uh, this article, there's an article on there that gives you more detail than some uh, just good general references about uh, Martin Fowler's uh, explanation of, you know, mocks aren't stubs and just general test doubles are awesome. And then there's this presentation. It's a remarker presentation, so that's on my GitHub page. Thanks, everyone. All right. Thank you, Tim. Okay, so I'm really excited that so many presentations up here, so many lightning talks were talking about science tonight, and that's really, really exciting to me. So tonight what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk to you about homeopathic code optimizations. <laughs> everybody knows, so everybody is aware of the facts of homeo homeopathy. We're all scientists here, right? So, but I'm sure that there's some people out there who don't know what homeopathy is, so I'm going to tell you about it. Uh, homeopathy is all about diluting stuff so that it just gets smaller and smaller and then it becomes more and more effective. Uh, and so when I was researching this, I did what every good scientist does. I went to Wikipedia and I was looking at Wikipedia, but the problem is that it's way too long. So I didn't want to read it, but you can do this thing. <laughs> you can do this thing on OS X where you highlight, you highlight the text. If you highlight the text, you can right click on it, and if we zoom in on there, you'll see that it says summarize. So you can click on that, and if you click on that, you can drag it down, and it, it basically like dilutes the text or not, or maybe condenses it. I'm not sure, but it's there is what it is in one line. So that's essentially what it is, and we have to like dilute everything by six times, and that's when it's most effective. And also the other thing is, if we read this, we know that uh, modern homeopathy, something, something, water, memory has memories, so the idea is that water has memories. So I was thinking, so I was thinking can white space have memories? And the answer is, of course, yes, it can. So uh, let's, do, let's do demo time, demo time. So I wrote a homeopathic code optimizer, and this is a video of it. I was gonna do a live demo, but I figured I probably shouldn't. So are we Good playing? Call. Is it playing? Is it playing? No? Okay, okay, there we go. Okay, so this is Fibonacci sequence. Everybody knows that this is the benchmark that you use. This is a realistic benchmark of all, uh, all interpreters of every, every single language. It is the totally most meaningful benchmark ever. And if you run it, you'll see, okay, we get, we get some Fibonacci out of there. And that's great, we run dilute on that. So this dilutes the code and you can see it's missing some stuff. There is a, a <laughs> There's a 10% chance of code going away. Uh, and if we run it, so we pipe that to Ruby and you'll see, okay, it, it executes. 
You know, watch my time here. Okay, so it executes, we still get Fibonacci, and then I can, I can dilute it again. You'll see it's missing more text. <laughs> and we can, we can run it, and it still goes. So it's still working. So you dilute it even more, and you can see it just the code keeps going away, and I'm going to dilute it six times, because that's, like the, that's the number. That's what, <laughs> that's what does it. <laughs> So you see, okay, they're diluted at six times. Do I dilute it anymore? I don't remember. I don't remember exactly what I did in this video. So okay, yeah, you can see I diluted. There's a sixth time. There we go. Yeah, yeah. Look at that. Look at that speed. Yeah, amazing, <laughs> amazing. It totally works. Okay, we got two minutes. I can do this. All right, run it again through Ruby. We're all good. We're all good. Awesome. Do I do any more after this? Uh, yeah, sure. Why not? Sure, look at me typing away live coding, this is amazing. I'm gonna just change that number to 33 and run it again to prove to you this is not fake, okay? Not at all, this is all very scientific. We went through a scientific method to do this. All right, thank you. So, <laughs> the question is, how does it work? I'm gonna tell you how it works. The VM remembers the code, it remembers it. <laughs> So it remembers the code that you had there before, and then it knows how to execute it. And also, like, the thing is, with, with homeopathic code optimizations, it's not white space, it's memories. <laughs> memories there, right? Uh, <laughs> so if we do, we do a little bit more, um, I don't know if I have time to do this. Maybe I do, please. Okay, so there's some code there, code there. Uh, I got lazy, I didn't want to run it through six times, so I just added a D. So you'll see that it runs it at 50, 50 C dilution right there. That, that removes 50% of the code, and I can remove it. That's 100%. <laughs> so that's the most effective, and you can see that, it's, that it still runs. <laughs> All right, so. <laughs> I don't know what else I did. Oh, 98. There we go. <laughs> That's one. All right. So benefits. Benefits. We'll talk about the benefits. It's faster, and we can know this. We can easily intuit this from this this one particular fact. We can intuit that it's faster because no code is faster than no code. Obviously, <laughs> it's faster. It goes faster. More diluted, the faster it is. So I want to show off some benchmarks. Um, this is benchmark. So oh, come on, come on, come on, come on. So we run the code. Run the code. Run the code. Okay, you can see that it's there. It takes like 1.67 seconds, and if we run it again, diluted, I redirect this to a file because I don't want to take dilution into account. Dilution time, we don't want it, right? This is scientific. This is science. Sometimes it's faster. <laughs> Sometimes it's faster. It's faster, just trust me. Also, uh, so it's more maintainable because obviously because there's no, mo no code to maintain. So, uh, and also the, the final thing with this is that less is more. So obviously, yes. All right, thank you very much. Yes, I'm Bobier, um, and I'm the poor schmuck that has to go after tender love. Uh, <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> now, my name is Bobby. I work at Carbon5. Uh, we have offices in Santa Monica and um, in San Francisco. Um, I'm a web developer, and I'm also a musician, and I have been playing drums my entire life, and I'm just going to demo this thing for you. All right, so let me explain what the hell that thing is. Uh, so this is a leap motion device, and I wrote all of this in Ruby to make it create, essentially emit MIDI to GarageBand. So I wanted to just, I have no slides. Um, I just wanted to show you the code that I did to write it, um, and I'd love to collaborate with people on making software instruments in Ruby. So if you're interested in doing stuff like that, I am very interested. So let's see. The stuff that I did to make this, I used two, like, I want to give a shout out. I used two gems that really helped with this. I used R2, which helped me communicate with the sleep motion. This little guy just basically broadcasts JSON data and gives me the fr exactly like what my hand's doing at a particular moment. And I wanted to be able to take what was happening and create surfaces. So I actually have like 
a snare drum surface right here, and then I have a bass drum surface, and then I have uh, like a hi-hat up here. So I can basically, am I still running that guy? Um, I can basically create sounds just out of thin air. So you could imagine that I could make a, you know, 80s hair metal 10-piece kit if I wanted to, um, which <laughs> I didn't have time to do before this, so I'm so sorry. Um, but I can make this a laser. I can make this any sound I want. Um, there's a lot of like interesting applications for music with this device. And I love writing in Ruby, and I've been writing in Ruby for about two years. And I'll just like walk through this real quick. It's a, basically a drum set class that uses this R2's D DSL to say, hey, this is a leap motion. Um, this thing's running in what's called a leap D process. Um, it's basically like exposing a WebSocket port uh, that broadcasts that JSON uh, frame data. And I just like, I'm basically hooking into it, creating these surfaces. So on the left is a surface class that um, I can tell it, hey, like I want this note value um, and I want it on these boundaries. So the first value is what it is, and then, or the first value is the, is the left boundary. Hold on one sec. Could I get this mic, Quiddy, please? Uh, can we get the, desk, the far desk mic, please? Thank you. Okay, cool. So yeah, the, the left boundary is the first value, the right boundary is the second, and then it's the drum note after that. Um, right now I have GarageBand running, but you could run Ableton or something else that can connect to um, that is able to accept MIDI. I could actually change up the effects of this. So if I wanted the kick to sound different, the hi-hat to sound different, um, I can use everything that's in my existing, um, my, my existing like, audio library to trigger any sample that I wanted. Uh, another thing is the way that I actually detect that this is a hit, which was uh, definitely the hardest part, um, was figuring out um, exactly like when I was traversing a boundary in space. So I logged the previous Y position of my hand, and then when, when I move past that boundary and then up again, I actually say, okay, you're a hit, otherwise you're not. Um, and now the, the trickiest thing for this was actually doing two hands at once. So. So that's just spawning threads for each of those. And the, every time a hit is, is, uh, is made so that I can have them running together at the same time. And to the human ear, they're not running at exactly the same time, but to the human ear they are. Um, yeah, so I made this thing. I'd love to collaborate with people um, on something like this. Uh, I like to mess around with Ruby and instruments. So yeah, that's it. Thank you. Hey everyone, I'm Jason Clark. Uh, I work for New Relic on the Ruby Agent, and I'm here today to talk to you about shoes. Um, before I get there, I wanted to make a brief diversion. So back in college in my software engineering class, one of my good friends that was in the class, any time that he learned something really cool, the professor would say something neat, he would balk like a chicken. And he called it the learning chicken. And so I wanted to bring the joy of the learning chicken to us today for this shoes presentation. So anytime that you feel like there's something cool or fun, yell, give me a chicken. Somebody? Go. Oh, is the sound on yet? Let's try. Okay, that's a little too loud. It's that, on. That's an angry chicken. All right, it is definitely on now. All right, so please. Throughout the course of this, anytime you want, give me a chicken. So, <laughs> all right, so what is Shoes? Shoes is a cross-platform GUI library that lets you write desktop apps um, easily and simply. The DSL is really accessible. Part of the idea is for kids and introductory people that are just getting started in programming to be able to write apps. It works on Mac, it works on Linux, and it even works on Windows. I mean. <laughs> Yeah, I've had to write batch files, people. Like, it, seriously, that's a chicken moment right there. So, Shoes was originally created by Y, the lucky stiff, and a uh, quirky uh, Rubyist from a few years back that some of you may know. Those of you who are newer to the community might not, and you should definitely look him up, read some of his uh, material. But he used this to create an application that he called Hackity Hack. This was a development environment that was specifically geared towards kids. And Hackity Hack was both written in shoes 
and the applications that you write in Hackity Hack are also built on shoes. And so it's a library that makes all of those things possible. But, chicken, por favor. Hmm? Chicken. chicken. Chicken me. <laughs> Thank you. Unfortunately, Y disappeared. He chose to leave. He took his code down from the internet. And for many people, they probably thought that that was the end of shoes. But fortunately, there were a couple of individuals that were key in keeping the dream alive of what um, had been built here. Steve Klabnik, in particular, picked up the Hackity Hack in the Shoes project and for a long time tried to maintain it and kind of keep things moving forward. And over time, a small uh, group of people kind of gathered around him and found a way forward for us to be able to continue. And so the Shoes 4 project was born. This is a rewrite of the original Shoes because the original Shoes was written in cross-platform C and it was really difficult for us to work with. You know, there's not a lot of Rubyists that want to write C in their spare time for something fun. And so Shoes 4 is written in Ruby. It's accessible, it's easy for any Rubyist to be able to get into. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so part of how we accomplish that is right now the current version of Shoes 4 is written in JRuby and takes advantage of the cross-platform stuff that the JVM provides for us. This actually makes it really simple for us to delegate the hard parts of writing stuff cross-platform to somebody else and build our DSL on top of it in pure Ruby. So what are things that you could do with Shoes? Let's take a look at a couple of demos. You can do animation and drawing. So here's a clock, just in case, you know, having a clock in the corner on your computer and on your phone and on the wall and everywhere else isn't enough. I'd like a chicken for that one. That sounds like a plan. <laughs> All right, there's a lot of games. Um, so here's a Minesweeper game. Let's see, can I find my cursor? I'm not mirrored properly. Uh, there we go. All right, am I going to... Uh, Dang it, I should have practiced Minesweeper before I came up here. Anyways, so there's one game. Um, another game that we have is a snake game. I'm also really bad at this one. But, you know, you can build all sorts of different fun things with it. Um, additionally, I built this presentation in Shoes. It's built with a library called Wingtips, so you can do that. And here is my favorite piece of code on the internet. This is a little Shoes application that I wrote with my daughter and it was contributed back to the Shoes Project as one of the samples. Here's what it looks like. I am way prouder of that than I probably ought to be, but there it is. Chicken? That's definitely a chicken moment. Anyways, Shoes is a great project. If you're a beginner, you should get involved. We've got newcomer-friendly items that are tagged. And here is where I'm gonna close. Um, this is my inspiration. This is my daughter teaching my dad about the program she wrote, and he taught me to program. This is the sort of thing that Shoes makes possible, and uh, I have a Birds of a Feather session at eight on this, so if you want to learn more, come along and hack on Shoes. Thank Chicken. you. Hi, I'm Chris. Um, myself, along with uh, uh, my friend Sean, uh, have been putting on an event called Ruby for Good, and um, we dedicate this event to making the world gooder. Um, I, I'm bringing this up mostly because uh, it's a, kind of a multi-day hack event, all-inclusive. We all kind of go commune style, sleep, prepare, you know, cook, prepare food for the other uh, attendees. Uh, and it's sort of hackathon style, but um, we want projects that uh, are either nonprofit or do some other socially um, good thing. Um, and we specifically don't want projects that we can work on for a few days and release them and then they die and not, not continue to help uh, the people out that they're intended to. So um, we are, we're looking for project ideas and want to have good things that uh, we can hack on. Uh, I think we were about uh, 70 people. Um, we don't have the dates yet. Uh, right now, if you go to rubyforgood.com, it uh, will tell you the dates from last summer. So it's kind of... Um, penciled in for this summer. And um, to reverse segue back, the thing that I actually wanted to talk about was uh, Miniswan. And uh, Sandy mentioned it in her keynote this morning, which is great because I think we need to be repeating this uh, multiple times so that it really sinks in. Uh, when I first started doing Ruby, this was one of the things that uh, really resonated with me, and I thought it was awesome. It stands for Matt's is nice, and so we are nice. Uh, and I think it's important to know that uh, 
Matt's is nice and so we are nice is not just uh, being cordial or uh, polite. It's also how we treat people online, um, how our code behaves, the, the way the projects that we work on uh, interact with other code and people. Um, talking to people and IRC and issues, it really is something that we need to uh, continue to embrace and keep repeating as more and more people come to events like this uh, so that we can, we can keep this moving forward and this really becomes uh, or stays part of our culture. So please, be nice. Um, and if you'd like one of these awesome 8-bit Matt's face Miniswan stickers, I have a couple of them left, so please come by and um, talk to me. Thank you very much. So, uh, hi everyone, Jonathan Slate, Leviathan, that was interesting. Leviathan Slate? Leviathan you should go by that Slate. from now on. <laughs> um, and taking a page from your book, um, yesterday I went to uh, uh, Loren Segel's presentation on, uh, on, let's see, it was, uh, it's so quiet, let's make music. It was really fascinating. Um, he talked a lot about waves, frequencies, amplitudes, pitch, volume, all that cool stuff. And then he talked about uh, some math stuff. Uh, I didn't get some of that. This was something about how, uh, do I, I don't have slides. Do oh, I'm on the wrong, oh, it's a separate window. There. Can I turn on mirroring or something? Yeah, if I'll go on mirroring. Command F1, Command F1. helpful. And Somebody in the audience always knows. Hey, okay. <laughs> So uh, somehow, uh, if you look at the first one sideways, you get the Fourier transform, which is the second one. I don't get that at all. But he told me I don't need the math, so I didn't need to worry about it. So uh, let's see. Um, so he had uh, some cool libraries. One of them was called Easy Audio. Um, I checked it out, and it was really neat. I played with some of these type things where you can basically create a, uh, an audio uh, stream and uh, write some waves to it. And he had a song. I'm going to put his song on. So uh, I'm going to let that play and keep talking. Um, so his code whoops, was here. Uh, this is a song. It has like a sound class and a sequencer class. And then he uses all that. But this is all just in an example, which I thought was was cool, but it was like, hey, you know, if I did all that work, I wouldn't just call it an example. So, um, so I made a gem that basically I just stole all that and uh, called it audio, uh, Easy Audio Sequencer, and I took his instruments, and I took his sequencer and his sounds class, and I put it all in there, and then, what am I doing? Um, sound. You can tell, being up here for like five minutes before your speech is great because it really gets the adrenaline going. Um, all right, so let's see, yeah. So this was basically his song. Uh, it sounds really cool. Um, um, I, this is just using my uh, gem, um, but it's basically the same thing. Um, I thought I'd also show like through the power of collaboration how we can make this even better. Of course, faster is better especially considering time. Somebody give me a random number between uh, 40 and, uh, thank you. Um, all right, we're gonna try playing that. It's obviously much better. Um, Apex Tim will be proud. So um, the other thing I did was uh, to take these tools and, uh, and do something uh, else where I have a random function that uh, um, basically I can pass in an instrument and it will randomly play some beats. So uh, basically this sequencer takes a bunch of sequences and uh, or frame something um, and it plays them. So uh, let's listen to the random thing. It sounds sort of like uh, Knight Rider but it's sort of random-ish. It's doing some random things. code while it's playing. So it's, uh, uh, there's different uh, numbers, the different numbers here rep represent different pitches. So uh, you get kind of a minor chord and then a whole step down to another minor chord and it works. And that's it. Um, so, oh, and the gem file, right, so to show you that. Yeah, so all you need to do to use this is to include uh, the Easy Audio and Easy Audio Sequencer gem. Maybe I could have done some dependency thing, but I did this like this morning, so enjoy. Thank you. Thank you, Leviathan. 
Hi everyone. Well, first of all, I'm not sure if I should be offended that my name was actually said correctly, but never mind. Um, and so my name's Amanda, and I would like to share with you some thoughts I've had about a somewhat unusual experience I think I've had in the Ruby community, which is actually bringing my baby to conferences. Um, so by the way, every photo in this talk has been taken at a Ruby conference and is of my baby, because I don't have photos of other people's babies at conferences. I'll do it. I don't that even know that you have Might be slightly weird. Um, so to start with, I'm a Ruby developer. I live down in Christchurch, New Zealand, and I've been working with Ruby since 2008. Um, I've been to nine conferences in that time in five different countries, and I've spoken at two of them. Um, and I really enjoy being part of the Ruby community, and I think it's a great place to work and spend sort of holiday time right now. My husband is also a Ruby developer. He used to be a Java developer, but I convinced him that clearly Ruby was a better place to be. And then finally, we have one child, Theo, who you may have seen running around the halls from time to time at the conference today. I think he knew that I was about to talk about him because he started crying earlier, so I apologize for that. Um, this is, in fact, his third Ruby event. He attended RubyConf Australia in February, Rails Camp New Zealand in March, and Rails Camps are amazing, so you should listen to Phil and go. And he's currently at RubyConf here. So, the sort of happy part of my talk, um, I originally wasn't sure about taking him to conferences, but I was sort of forced into it because I proposed a talk and was accepted. Um, he was six months old, and as he was still a breastfed baby, I couldn't actually leave him behind, especially to travel overseas. Ruby um, Conf Australia kindly gave my husband a ticket so he could come as my nanny. Also, <laughs> also um, I really wanted a world where I didn't have to be making these really decisions between my family and my work, so I figured if I wanted to be a world where I could take babies to conferences, I had to start it or at least be the person to try it and see if we all agree that it works or I get told to go away. Um, yeah, so I really wasn't sure what the reaction would be, but it was really positive. Um, so I was going to bring him on stage today, but as you heard, he's not having the best afternoon, so. Um, yeah, so the reaction was far more positive than I expected. There were a lot of comments about how um, it was a lot of fun and it sort of added to the atmosphere. In fact, I was really worried about so him making noise, people being confused or sort of upset about the fact that there was a baby at the conference. Um, those things didn't actually end up being a problem at all. The things that did end up being a problem were the things I didn't really expect. <laughs> he, he kicked it on the floor, but luckily no babies or lightofuloid were harmed. Um, Railscape New Zealand was also a great time. Everyone was really welcoming. So those were excellent experiences. Now we sort of come to the dark part of my experience, which is this conference. Uh, the conference itself is actually great. I didn't want to offend the organizers there. Um, so I've been the primary caregiver for my son for the last year, and so I haven't really been earning any money. Um, so my husband could get a ticket from his work. They paid for him to come, but for me to pay and get a ticket when I didn't have any income and somebody also was going to have to be leaving talks to mind the baby wasn't something that we could justify. Also, as Phil pointed out, it's a bit of a distance to New Zealand and so I didn't have any um, convenient babysitters who could help me out. So this made me, was making me think, I am the stereotype. I'm a female programmer who's actively involved in the community, who had a child and was suddenly finding it really difficult and sort of fading out of the community. Um, luckily, the story has a slightly unexpected happy ending, which is at the last minute last week, Bug Snag had a spare ticket and they offered it to me, um, which was really lovely of them. And I've got a friend whose husband's here and, he, and she's been looking after Theo for the keynotes and so I could attend some of the talks. Beyond that, me and my husband have been trading off. Um, but for the future, obviously, that's not something that everyone can do. I wanted to sort of try and think about what some options were. Because I'm not sure if I'm an edge case to programming parents a long way from home, or if I'm sort of the canary in the coal mine, and this is something we're going to be dealing with in the future. 
So things we can do, a welcoming environment, so far I've found not to be a problem, I've found everyone to be really amazing and supportive, so well done. Perhaps childcare at conferences is something that could be considered in the future, I know it gets sort of discussed. Shared tickets, where two parents could come and attend talks one at a time while the other one is elsewhere with the child. Or I'm sure there are other things, I'd love to hear your thoughts. I just sort of wanted to start some conversation around this. So thanks everyone very much. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Thank you. So my name is Kosti, and um, I also brought my family here. One trick for this is get Southwest, make the company pay for it, get Southwest for your family. You can ride in the same airplane, then get Airbnb. You can expense it, you have a kitchen, you have everything, right? So. Um, do you guys see my screen? Okay, Maybe a little good. bigger. So let me show you a what moment of Ruby. Can we turn on this? Can we turn on this, please? Please. Hello? So let's do this. Oh, look at that. Let's try this one. Oh, that works. <laughs> Let's try this one. That doesn't work. That doesn't work. That doesn't work. Oh, man, I guess Ruby just doesn't like and, you know? Let's, uh, let's leave it at that. <laughs> This is, I'm trying to make a collection of Ruby Watts, you know? Maybe at the end of the talk, somebody can, can lighten up this for me. And I'm gonna unplug this. I'm just, just gonna do, tell you a story. Tell you a story about, we got, we got a talk here from a guy who was a cop, right? And what he learned about being a cop, right? I have a talk about my previous job and how that helps in programming a little bit. I'm gonna try to make it short, right? So I was always good with computers. I was a programmer before and I decided to get out of it at some point just to be a normal person. I always wanted to be a normal person, right? Um, you know, I'm just at least average, you know? So not like, not like a nerd, you know? So I, I got an opportunity to come to America and I said, okay, this is my chance, man. I'm gonna be normal in America. So um, I said, my, my job was to work at a salmon fishery, and for about, you know, like, during the salmon season, it's a cool job, you get overtime, and then you get to be a normal person afterwards, right? So, that fell off, and I, I my offer actually ended up being to be a, doing housekeeping. Now, I ended up working for a Venezuelan guy in Orlando, housekeeping, contracting, that sucked a lot. Contracting, I mean housekeeping. Working full-time for a hotel, that's nice, working contracting, you work all the time to any hotel, you know? So how does that, how does that help? How, how, I sucked at housekeeping, okay, first of all. I was working on a Romanian team, I'm Romanian, okay? The Mexicans were kicking our ass. And, and we were slow, they were coming to help, and then there's QA, like software development, there's this, like we have software development life cycle, there's a housekeeping life cycle, right? So you go clean the room, right? Nobody tells you how to do it. Like sometimes you get out of college, you get a job, it's like that. But then QA comes in and says, come clean again, you know? And uh, that's what was happening to us. And sometimes the Mexicans were coming to help us because we had to go home, right? So what does that teach you about, <laughs> you know, like it, this is a little bit like the karate kid, kid. Like what is this, wax on and wax off, right? And sometimes it comes into play in my, in the normal job, like bam, like that, and then the reflexes come in, you know? Like housekeeping, you go, come, you go over there and try to clean a hotel room. The most important thing is, <laughs> the most important thing is stay in one place. That's what our owner told us. That's what you try to stay in code, especially when you go refactor code. Housekeeping is like refactoring code, a lot, a lot of it, and, um, Let's see, it's about, <laughs> like, <laughs> Gomez over there is laughing, so I kind of lost my train of thought. <laughs> <laughs>
you mess you mess me up. So, so <laughs> okay, like yeah. So it's like this: the people that want to go into the hotel room, they want to pretend that nobody else lived there. They don't want to see any hair, any fingerprints. That's what you want to focus on. This is the MVP, man. So you want to just clean up the the previous the previous life presence and then move on to the next thing. This is working with legacy code. You touch the minimum part that you want that you that you have to touch and then get out of it. And because um, I I knew a sales guy. That's another story. <laughs> um, so first of all, stay in the same spot. Second, always be cleaning. A B C. The processor, basically what I was doing, go to one spot, do one thing, go to another spot, do another thing. Your hands are like the processor. They always have to be cleaning. You go, do a trip to the hard drive, you come back, you always have to stay in the same spot. So this is a lot like system design, like the same like manufacturing goes, manufacturing agile went into programming. There's a lot of stuff from any other job that you can go into and get it into programming. Um, like as a conclusion is don't multitask, stay in one place, finish what you had and move on to the next thing. Uh, also as a conclusion about the computer, keep it in the same space, don't do cache misses, um, optimize the, the working queue, keep your processor busy all the time, especially these days when it's so fast. That's about it, thanks a lot. All right. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Colin Kelly, um, co-founder at Invoca. We've been writing Rails since, and Ruby code since 2008 up in Santa Barbara. Um, I want to talk about two things I really enjoy. One is aspect-oriented programming, and the other is Ruby uh, 2.1, and I want to show you some code. Um, so first of all, get this out of better. As far as what aspect oriented programming is, it's separation of cross-cutting concerns. So that's something we all know we want to go with single responsibility principle. And I want to show you an example we had in our code base and how much cleaner it came out when we applied uh, Ruby 2.1. I want to show first here uh, prepend. So here I've got a little bit of code down here. I've got a partner API, and I'm including a couple modules, and I'm prepending a couple modules. And each one of those up here, just for example, every one of them just does a put S of where it is and call super. Anybody know the order that this is going to actually execute? Anybody want to yell, yell that out when I call, call this object? That's right. So let's check it out here. Paste it in over there. EDBC, EDCB. Yeah, so let's check that out. If we look at the actual code, we ran E and D actually ran before this class's own method. So prepend sits at the top of the ancestor uh, in front of the very class. That is incredibly powerful for aspect-oriented programming. So I want to show you an example where we use that. Let's close this guy out here. Where, how do I get rid of that? So here we have a partner API. How many of you have a service that depends on some partner's API that's actually got to be running all the time? It's a, a big thing in our product. We all live in the SaaS world, and we, we believe in using other people's SaaS services. So here's a partner API. We realized from bad experiences that we had to um, monitor this API and know whether it was working. So here's version zero of it. Here's one of the methods, and down at the bottom, we have our little metrics class where we go out to Graphite and show whether it succeeded or failed. So that's version zero. You can see it's not great because we're mixing two different concerns in one bit of code. Here's version one. It's getting better. There's the public method. It deals with setting up the metrics, and then it calls down into a private method that does the actual work. This is better. But now the important part of the class is down in the private section, and the public section is dealing with a cross-cutting concern. 
Here's version two, got a whole lot better. What we've got here is published success metrics is now a module that we've included. There's our public method, and all we had to do is down here say public, publish success metric, and we name the method, and it wraps it automatically. So I want to show you how that actually works. Here's publish success metrics, the module. When it's included, we open up the base class that included us, and we create a thin veneer module that sits above that by prepend. That's the place that we can add this aspect-oriented code. Down here we have a couple handy class methods, one that lets us set up a prefix, and then when we actually call that macro, publish success metric, check this out. That goes in class eval, writes a method of the same name. I have a little helper down here that gets the signature by reflection. It calls a helper to publish the API success and then lands in super. Isn't that pretty cool? So you've got a tiny layer above you don't have to think about. And the last version I have is version three, uh, thanks to uh, Bob Smith, my coworker, for pointing this out. In Ruby 2, the def of a method returns its name as a symbol, so that's all it takes. A single decorator sitting at the front of a method is all it takes to provide that wrapper. No alias method chain, uh, nothing, nothing confusing. All right, that's what I wanted to show you. Very nice. And I think I can uh, wrap that up. I'm Colin D. Kelly on Twitter, also on GitHub, and I put this up there uh, on, uh, on GitHub right before the talk. Thank you. So I'm here to, I, my name is Michael Hartle. I'm here to tell you about publishing the Ruby on Rails tutorial with Softcover. I, I, I'm curious, actually, just to get a show of hands. How many people here have, have read the Ruby on Rails tutorial use the screencasts? Thank you. <laughs> cool. All right. Uh, so the, the first couple uh, versions of the first, first couple editions of the Ruby on Rails tutorial were made using kind of a hack together ebook publishing system, kind of information uh, product marketing platform that, that I wrote just for my own purposes. But uh, earlier this year, a couple of friends and I launched a, a, a more polished version, basically optimized for the kind of products that I make, called Softcover. And uh, in fact, the current Rails tutorial website runs uh, as part of the Softcover platform. So I want to show you a couple things that Softcover can do. Um, during Matt's keynote, he mentioned something about uh, this arrow syntax. Let me show you. This is ru actually running locally now. Uh, chapter 11 of the Rails tutorial mentions this uh, syntax for making lambdas. And I call it an arrow syntax, but I didn't know it had a name. Uh, Matt's mentioned it in the keynote. It's called a stubby lambda. Stabby lambda, awesome. This is real time uh, copy editing of the Ruby on Rails tutorial. So this is the source of the Ruby on Rails tutorial book. Let me say, the readers of, of this book have been unbelievably helpful. I get uh, emails and tweets all the time from people uh, telling me that, uh, you know, that they caught an error, I mean literally, I fixed a couple errors during the keynote yesterday because people were tweeting at me. It's awesome. So one of the cool things about the soft cover is that it comes. It's a there's a command line interface that has a full ebook production system, and you can see it actually automatically reloaded uh, the web page here. And we've already, in fact, updated um, this chapter. And uh, so one of the things you can do is you can publish it to the live site. Uh, let me show you that site. So this is the main marketing page. Here's a description of the book. There's uh, there are product bundles. The soft cover uh, supports ebooks and also arbitrary media bundles. Um, it also bundles with other products. So here's the uh, solutions manual for exercises that comes bundled with uh, all of the different uh, pricing tiers. Here's the, the bio. There's some testimonials and so on. This all lives inside a marketing file on your local disk as part of a Git repository. Um, this is one that came over last year. I found out that Jimmy Wells, founder of Wikipedia, had uh, made an answer on Quora saying that at the moment his favorite book was the Ruby on Rails tutorial. So I thought, well, that's going in my testimonials. Um, <laughs> so here he is. Uh, so all of this information is, is available uh, you know, locally on your disk, but then with a, a single command, you can update it on the live site. And uh, a lot of you probably know that the Ruby on Rails tutorial is available for free in its entirety online as regular web pages. And um, now Stabby Lambda is live. This is on the actual live website. Well, 
<laughs> while I was talking, it updated. So one of the cool things about it is that the publishing, uh, the, the barrier to publishing is incredibly low. It just, uh, you can push out new versions of things really easily. Um, I just uploaded the HTML, but soft, the soft cover gem also produces EPUB, Mobi, and PDF from the same uh, input format. So everything is in sync automatically. And of course, I've been publishing the screencast too. The, the third edition book is out. 10 of the 12 screencasts are, are out, and I just need to edit down the final two. And then the launch will, I mean, I'll be doing all of the, all of the stuff I'm doing, all the marketing is all through Softcover. Um, so Softcover is open to other authors. It's, it's been sort of optimized for my uses, but uh, starting in 2015, I'm really gonna make an effort to, to switch sort of now that I'm done, or I'm all at the brink of being done with the third edition. Uh, I'm going to focus a lot more on bringing more authors on board. And we have uh, several plans to lower the barrier to getting started with this kind of company. And so the, the real vision here is to make it possible for many more people to build these sorts of information product companies. The, uh, for authors who aren't co-founders of the platform, uh, the royalties are very generous, 90% royalty rate, and, and that includes it to the 10% that Softcover takes absorbs uh, transaction fees, uh, storage and bandwidth, and so on. So I really think that many, many more people could be making these sorts of companies, everything from like 50 bucks a month all the way up to something that makes six figures per year or even more. Um, so find me online, tweet at me, send me some email, and I'd love to tell you more if you're interested in using Softcover. Thanks. Thank you, Michael. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Pam. I graduated a few weeks ago from a boot camp in DC, um, and they asked me to become an instructor for the next cohort. Um, so my class started yesterday, but I wasn't there because I'm here and because this is better. And um, initially, I wanted to talk about the imposter syndrome and how I was like starting to feel that um, getting into the new job. But um, I just like decided to change that topic a few hours ago and talk about what I call the newcomer syndro syndrome. Because um, coming to RubyConf, it's my first time at a tech conference ever. And um, I wanted to talk about something that relates to that experience. So what is the newcomer syndrome? Um, I like to think of it as when you go into like a new experience or a new setting, that feeling that you have that um, you're gonna say something stupid or like ask a stupid question or appear like you don't know anything and everybody's gonna judge you and look at you like you're that person, like nobody talked to that person because they're dumb, you know, and you're just gonna be alone and cry. So um, I was very lucky to have Brandon Hayes as my guide and he introduced me to a bunch of people. We had some great conversations, but a lot of it, I honestly didn't know what was going on um, a bunch of new technology terms were thrown at me, but I was just like smiling and nodding because I was too afraid to ask questions and kind of like stop them in their tracks and have them, you know, explain things to me. Um, so to kind of like change things and kind of like, I guess, um, face my fears, I decided to stand in front of you guys and give this talk and kind of be very vulnerable and voice uh, this fear. And I'm hoping that any newcomer um, that feels the same can realize and see that they're not alone. And if you've ever felt that way ever before, we're all feeling the same thing and that's awesome. Um, so yeah, so this is my talk. I was very nervous because I, I, I re I'm really scared of like public speaking, so this is also a big step for me. I hope you guys could relate to it. I hope it wasn't too bad. Give it up Thank for you. Pam. <laughs> and you, do? You, you can follow your time. me on the Twitter at Pam underscore Yam. All right. Thank you. Thank you.